and good morning and happy Sabbath church. I'd like to welcome you with a thought from the psalmist. David said in Psalm 122, I believe, he said, I was glad when I was told we were going to the house of the Lord. Is that your opinion? Are you glad that you are here? What a great thought. Yeah. What a blessing. So uh, with that thought, welcome to you. If you're a visitor, glad to have you. If you're a faithful member, thank you so much for supporting every week, week after week. So welcome. And to our online uh, visitors, thank you for wherever you are in the, this big world. Welcome to Hamilton Church this morning. Um, we've got a few announcements to share that there will be no lunch next Sabbath because of our church camp. Uh, we still have our week of prayer. Um, I'd like to call a couple of people up. Is Kate there? Kate is... no? Kate had an announcement, I believe, and outside. Um, can they hear me outside? And uh, Pauline, we have an announcement too, if you want to... Come on, Kate, we've got two ladies and Pauline, both come up. Kate, Kate first. Kate, you've got something to tell us? Yes. Regarding the church camp, um, plans are definitely in progress and it's very exciting. Um, so those who have registered already, um, that's wonderful. We're so glad that you're coming. Those who haven't yet, you won't be able to order food, um, but you still can, um, uh, what's the word? Enroll, no. Apply, register, um, <laughs> register um, uh, until tonight. Um, so, to, uh, actually, the end of Sunday. So, Monday morning, we'll be allocating um, who uh, sleeps where. So, we really need all registrations uh, by then. And yeah, you just need to organize your own food if you're registering um, anytime in the future. Great. So, you got that? If you want to eat, you've got to organize. Pauline, thank you, Kate. This event is in a couple of weeks' time. That camp sounds very exciting. Um, we won't be there because exciting for us, our middle son is turning 42, so we'll be in Brisbane. Yes, I know I'm as shocked as you that we have a 42-year-old, but we actually have one that's older. Anyway, another exciting event is our Hamilton Church um, women's ministries. On the Sunday of the 17th of March, um, we're having an outing. It doesn't cost our women anything, so come along, have some morning tea by the lake, enjoy those lake views and enjoy some company and, and a cuppa on us and a little bit of fun and devotional time together. A couple of people, couple of mums um, have said that there's a Pathfinder camp on, they might have a, a younger child with them. That's absolutely fine. If you do, Uncle Graham here has volunteered. There's a, in um, where we'll actually be, there's a, a little play area nearby, but he'll have um, a few activities as well and he's very happy to buy any kids that might come um, some morning tea too. Um, if you'd like to come, if you would let Michelle know, Michelle, can you give everybody a wave? Michelle's just down there. Let Michelle know and, um, and I'll collect some names, not next Sabbath because we'll have camp and birthdays and we'll see you in a week or so's time. Thank you, Pauline. Just one or two more announcements. Remember we have a food pantry here on Thursdays and uh, weekly prayer meetings. It's by Zoom and it's on Wednesday at 7 by Zoom. I think we're good to go. Thank you.
Let's all stand and sing him 495. Near to the heart of God. There is a place second song is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, 290. Amen. Glory and grace. 
through death into life everlasting. He pass and we follow him there. Over us sin no more has dominion. For more than and of us we are. Ten your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This word shall not fail you, he brought. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely deep in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. It's children's story now. All children, can you come in the front? Samantha has got a beautiful story, even for bigger kids as well. would like to give us an opening prayer you okay. Lord, um, Lord I thank you for this day I thank you for letting us come to church I bless that you have us pass through this world without sin in our lives I thank you for giving us this day and um, I bless you, help the people who are homeless. Thank you, Ivan. All right, quick question for you guys. What do you guys like to eat when it's... I haven't finished the question. What do you like to eat when it's hot? Yes? Ice cream? Yes? When it's hot, okay, interesting. Okay. What do you like to drink when it's hot? Cold water, water with ice or no ice, slushy, sprite, that's interesting. So, okay, here is a scenario for you guys. Let's say you come home one day, like on a very hot day, and then you want water with ice, right? And then you open the fridge, and then you check the ice tray and there's no ice. What will you do? Uh, 
Okay. Fill it up, right? So if you find an ice tray that is empty, your first thought would be to fill it up, right? So, um, okay, let's pretend my Bible is the ice tray. Can you show me how you'd take it, fill it up, and put it in the fridge? So this is the fridge. That's the tap. And then take it back. Okay, no, the tap is there. And then this is the fridge. Show me how you do it. Oh, you should start here. Come and take the tray. Then fill it up. Ah, it's gone. You need to start again. It's gone. Thank you, Ivan. Is your eyes ready after you've sat down? It's ready? What happens if you take it now? What happens if you take it after five minutes? What happens after 10 minutes? Would you use it like that? Is that how you like it? And then what happens after 30 minutes? Is it the way you like it? Okay, what happens after two hours? Is it ready to eat? Okay. Oh, we don't have eyes. So let's take lessons from this story, right? So this ice is what you want, right? So uh, what do you want? What, what, what present do you want from your parents or from God? Uh, okay, anything else? Like a bike or something? Yeah? Okay, she wants a scooter, right? So this is her wanting the scooter, right? So she's going to go and think about it. Okay, this is her <clears throat> going to think about what she wants, right? And then, I'm sorry, I've got flu. So did you notice how um, careful Ivan came when he was bringing the ice tray? So this is a lesson that when you are bringing your um, requests and wants to your parents or to God, you need to be careful in the approach that you use, number one. And number two, you need to be respectful. So when you are bringing your request to the fridge or to God, to your parents, you come in a careful manner and you come with respect. Right, kids? You can't just say, Mom, I want ice. You just have to be like, Ah, oh, Mom. Uh, lately, I've been feeling hot. You know, just ask your mom nicely, you know. So the approach that Ivan used to come slowly is the same approach we use when we come to God and tell him what we want, right? And then once you've put the ice in the fridge, after you've prayed to God that you want a, a scooter, you don't come back after one minute and say, where's the scooter, right? So there's an element of patience that we learned today that ice does not become ready in one minute. So what we need to do is have patience while the ice is cooking in the fridge, right? And the, in the freezer, yeah. And then, remember it's a hot day. And after two hours, you're finally going to have ice. And that's like the greatest thing to have ever. So patience, with patience, great things come out of it, right kids? 
So we'll find that um, in the book of Hebrews 10, verse 36. Um, it says... For ye need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So with patience, good things come out of it. So if you, you ask God for something, or if you ask your parents for something, we really need to have patience. And then with patience comes the good things. Are we going to have patience from today? Mm, are we going to take the ice after one minute? After two hours, right? Yes. So that is an element of patience that we learn when we ask things from God or when we ask things from our parents. Um, let us close in prayer. Um, Father God, who art in heaven, we thank you for this day that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for this lesson that you bring unto us that, teach, that teaches us to have patience and uh, be careful in the way we approach you and have so much respect when uh, we come to you, Lord. Um, please uh, help the children learn patience through these small object lessons like an ice tray and ice, Lord. Um, let them learn how it connects to you and um, how they can learn more about you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Samantha, for the wonderful key words. Uh, after patience, good things happen. So uh, this is the offering time. And the offering is about, uh, it goes to look. It's, it's it yes, it works. Ah. I start, I start again. Thank you, Samantha, for the wonderful keywords um, for your children lesson. Uh, the patient brings about good outcome. Uh, the offering of today uh, is about local church budget. And um, um, in the church, uh, deacons will be around. Uh, you are able to put in a, the, the pocket they sucked, or use the uh, QR code over there. Or people are online watching us. Go online. Do you are um, offering there? Um, the word I want to read is from Psalm fifty-four, verse six says. We have a free will offering. Are we, are we sacrifice to you? Are we give thanks to your name, O oh Lord, for it is good? Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you do uh, in our lives. This time, um, we are going to offer what we got uh, from you. Um, help everyone to offer what they got. And they help those who don't have today. And this offering will bring good outcome to multiply your children. And at the end, we will see you in the heaven. We pray this your name, Jesus. Amen. Deacons, your time to show up. Um, <clears throat> the local church budget goes, as Louis mentioned, to, uh, to cover and to help with a number of things. And um, one of those things is helping with structural updates and uh, building renovations. If you look at the front platform of our church, you'll, look, you'll notice it looks a little bit funny. And if you come up closer, you'll see that it's pretty unfinished. But it's got this beautiful, more practical setup than it used to have, where there was a wall all the way around that high 
and then a brick pulpit here. But this was just phase one. And uh, this year, uh, probably between May and August, we're going to be building stage two and finishing it for uh, kind of the beautiful finish that we are looking for. We'd love to also put sails out there in the courtyard to make it functional for lunches, for church lunches, as well as community programs so that it's waterproof and usable with you know, tables and chairs. And so lots of different things that we've been kind of talking about. And if you missed our last church, uh, it was more a church think tank than a business meeting. Um, there is another one coming up, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on changes that you'd like to see us make to our sanctuary here. Well, um, as you see in the bulletin, now is our uh, question and answer time. If we sit down, can you see us? I think some of you may struggle to see us past the pulpit, no? I know the cameras can get around the pulpit, but is this all right? Yeah? Okay, great. Well, um, Cynthia, how many of you know Cynthia? Raise your hand if you know Cynthia. Awesome. Just about everybody. Cynthia, you've been in Hamilton Church for longer than, than the majority of us here. What was the first year that you walked in this building? Uh, 2015. All right, 2015. How many people here were here in 2015 or before? I know we have a number. I know the Tui Mawalunga family also, uh, who is here today, and a number here, and some who are not yet or not able to make it to church today, like Deidre mm -hmm. and Maria Morgan and such. Yeah. Um, but you've been here a long time. Now, um, when we arrived in 2019, Sharissa and I, uh, you were here at church. And since then, um, you know, God led you to arise. You worked uh, for a year, a little more than a year, yeah? Uh, Bible working up north mm -hmm. in um, Byron Bay and also Alstonville, yeah? Yeah, well, at the aged care. At the aged yeah. care place, yes. And so we were praying that for some time that God would bring us uh, someone who would be a gospel worker and dedicate their time and energy to uh, serving the Lord here. And the reason why I've asked Cynthia, albeit pretty last minute, um, to kind of ask the questions in this question and answer time is because for uh, the next while, Cynthia is dedicating like an average of 15 hours a week of her life every week to sharing the gospel here um, in our community to help us reach our church members who are eager to study the Bible and learn to study the Bible with others. And so, yeah, very exciting things coming up and happening. And if you have a Bible question, go to Cynthia. Yeah, just go to Cynthia. I was going to say, or come to me, but no, just go to Cynthia and um, pick all of your toughest questions. And if she doesn't know the answer, I'm sure she'll be inspired to go study for an answer to that question and to show you how she came to the conclusion so that you can the next time on your own. Um, so first off, I'll just throw a question in before the, we get to those two, and that's where are Sharissa and Judah today? A number of people have asked. They are doing a, or they were doing, they'd be done by now, but by the time they drive back here, church will virtually be done for us. They're at Avondale Memorial Church today doing a Faith FM um, Sabbath school program. So that's where they are. Auntie Mars, Auntie Marlita is up looking after baby Judah while, uh, while his mom was on the program with Pastor Danny. And uh, so, yeah, it's uh, just me and the guitar today. Um, we didn't have, and by the way, that's last minute, we didn't have a pianist as of yesterday or last night. And so I said, well, I haven't played for quite a while, but um, I can play my guitar to accompany. So thanks for putting up with the guitar um, to our musicians, my apologies, but well done. Praise the Lord. Okay, moving on. Right. Questions. Yeah, so as you know, we have the question and answer box. It's still out there. And you can put in your questions about the sermon or about any questions you have about the Bible. And Pastor Justin can answer them during the question and answer time. So from last week, um, it says, last Sabbath, you shared about how God put eternity in our hearts. How do we... And how we were made for more than this. Is Christianity the only faith that teaches this? Mm, yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. So uh, last week, the message was called Made for More. And the key phrase of the message was, you know, God is speaking to us all the time that you were made for more than this, more than this life, more than this world, more than this planet, more than your career, more than even the best things that this life has to offer. We were made for more. Um, that comes from 
Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, that says, He has made everything beautiful in His time, and He has also put eternity in their hearts. And so God has placed eternity in our hearts and a longing and desire for more. This is something that is recognized in other world religions. In fact, I got a, a very interesting message forwarded to me um, by a, a friend of ours here at church. And uh, we were talking about it at the pantry community meal even on Thursday evening. Um, but this is, what, um, this is what she forwarded me. It's, it's a quote from a Neoplatonian Neo philosopher. So like, yeah, I think uh, that's what they call them. Neoplatonian philosopher. And um, it, his name is Plotinus. And he said this. So this is like a Greek philosopher. Men have forgotten that to which from the beginning onwards their longing and effort are pointed. For all that exists desires and aspires toward the supreme, capital S, supreme, by a compulsion of nature, as if divining by instinct that they cannot exist without it. In other words, all of us are longing for the supreme, the divine. We're all longing for God. We're longing for something more. So other religions recognize this. Where other religions differ to Bible-based Christianity is that the Bible is the only source of truth that clearly identifies what that is. It gives answers to the three biggest questions in life. Where have we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? And so Jesus said in John 17, verse 17, while praying to his father, he said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So other holy books of other religions and other religions have have various bits and pieces, but they're broken pieces of truth in their faiths. And uh, these are truths that are God's truth nonetheless, but the Bible is the only source that has those truths uncluttered and in fullness of beauty and power. Does that make sense? So these broken pieces of truth in other religions are great um, stepping stones and bridges that we can use to connect with people of other faiths and say, hey, that's really interesting that you believe this and that your holy book teaches this. I believe the same thing. Look at what the Bible has to say. And by doing so, we seek to bring them over to an understanding of the Bible and to examine and test the Bible to see if it's legit, to see if it's actually inspired by an all-knowing God. And uh, we're going to have a sermon series later on um, tackling that. Like, why, why can we trust the Bible? Or can we trust the Bible? What are some of the reasons that um, Bible-believing Christians have come to the conclusion that we can? And how can we share it with those who don't yet trust that it's inspired? Amen. Thank you for that answer that was based on the Bible. I think I really appreciate that, that your answers are from Bible verses, not just, oh, I think I heard this one. Very encouraging. And inspires us as well as we answer questions about the Bible to go back to the Bible because that's where the answers are. Um, our next question is, how can I be more inspired in my spiritual walks and devotional life? Mm, yeah, great question. Um, so I was inspired last night when I sat down to, to read something and I'll I brought it up on the platform, but it's across the way. So I'll grab it in a minute and show you. Uh, but before that, you know, like I think, oh, thank you, sister. Um, I think that oftentimes we tend to mentally compartmentalize our lives. So we'll say, you know, here is a like, you know, if you were to slice up your time into a pie chart and you were to say, you know, this is my time with family. This is my social time with friends. This is my time for hobbies. This is my time for work. This is my time for church and church related things, etc. And you divided up all your time and recognize where your time goes, then we kind of relegate our faith to Sabbath, <laughs> all right? Especially post COVID, it seems like more and more people are like, hey, I can help with something on Sabbath, but any other day than that, and I just don't have time. And that's a partly a symptom of the busyness of the world that we live in. And I, I can resonate and I understand. Um, but God doesn't want us to just like section off our faith to a portion of our life. He wants it to be like the pie tin that holds the whole pie together. So in work, you're praying for opportunities to share your faith with people, right? To have spiritual conversations. Um, in school, you're befriending classmates and as you befriend them, you're praying for opportunities to share your faith. You may wanna invite them to an event at church that's coming up that you know would, spark, would be interesting to them. Um, in your social time, in your outings to the store, like take tracts with you or QR codes to things that you found interesting and share them with people. 
These are ways that weaving our faith into every aspect of our life, it's very hard to be uninspired because God is constantly at work and we're seeing his hand constantly. Um, but if we just say, you know, like Saturday is my time for God, Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown, then we're going to be missing out on a lot of beautiful golden opportunities. Um, something else I would encourage you to do is break down your time. Get a piece of paper and break down your time. Give an estimate of how much time you spend doing different things throughout the week. How much time do you spend on social media? How much time do you spend watching things online, Netflix or YouTube or whatever you may watch if you watch anything online? Audiobooks, um, work, how much time you spend on work. And just factor in and look at how much time you're spending on spiritual things. And you know, like, as we spend more time on spiritual things, um, the Bible says the, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit wars against the flesh. If there are two dogs and they are on leashes and they hate each other and they're going to fight constantly and you call one flesh and the other one spirit, if you starve one of them, it is going to become weaker and weaker and weaker and it's going to lose those battles against the other one. Does that make sense? So if you starve the spirit, if you starve spirit, then that dog's going to become weaker and weaker and weaker and the flesh is going to be winning the battles that you end up having. But if you starve the flesh, then the spirit and you feed the spirit, healthfully, then that means as you do spiritual things, you're going to be stronger and stronger spiritually. Just kind of basic logic. But some people are like, man, I just don't know why I don't have strength in my personal life. And I ask them, about how much time a week would you say you're spending with God? And they pause and they go, actually, okay, I get your point. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought of it that way. Uh, but that is how things work. Now, last night, oh, thank you so much. I... I had picked this up last Sabbath here at church, and I encourage you, grab one of these on your way out. It's a magazine called The Adventist World, and it's so easy to just get caught up in our little neck of the woods here and to miss out on remembering that we're a part of a worldwide movement of believers. Like, we're a part of a, a worldwide network. You just open it up, and it's called The Art of Bible Study. That was this month's, um, this month's uh, what do you call this? Not episode, but... Um, Issue, thank you. Yeah, this month's issue. And you open it up, and Justin Kim, Seven Levels of Bible Study, just a short section. Just pick it up and take it home. And when you get some free time, go and look through the headlines, just the captions, you know, like the titles of the different articles. And this is what inspired, well, a few things in it inspired me. But you've got the number 1,729, and you've got the number 240 and 300. And these are different sections of this these first few pages, 1,729 is the number of baptisms that took place at the end of an evangelistic campaign in San Fernando, Nam Nam, the, in the Philippines. 1,729 people were baptized at the end of a series. How amazing is that? I mean, that's inspiring. You want to be inspired in your walk with God? Like, look at what he's doing around the world. Here's Faith FM, you know, with a, a story here as well. Um, here, just one more and then, you know, Oh, two more things out of this. This little church became a Seventh-day Adventist church. They were an interdenominational church, and the pastor and some leaders of the church were visiting in the mountains regularly, this isolated place, and studying with the people. And they started seeing Bible truth and saying, wow, that makes sense. That's Bible truth. Now, that's Bible truth, too. That makes sense. And now the church recently put up a sign. They are now a Seventh-day Adventist church there in southern Mexico. So amazing stories like this. And then you go through and there's a mission focus and there's different articles, but you've got to check this one out. This is called the Bible Study Gallery. And this is just taking a look at different people's Bibles to see how they study the Bible and how they mark their Bibles. They're in different languages. We've got everything from Russian to Korean to, um, you know, to Portuguese to, um, to Kinerawanda um, to you know, John Bradshaw's Bible from It Is Written. We got Ted Wilson's Bible in here, um, Hensley Morovin, and all kinds of different people, Alejandro, Alejandro Bullon. And so you get to see a picture of their Bible. And let me tell you, that's really inspiring to see these men of God that are among the leaders of our church, like loving their Bibles, marking their Bibles so they can share their Bibles. This is really, really inspiring stuff. And so Adventist World, an amazing magazine, I confess I've been guilty of not picking them up every month 
but I will be now, and I encourage you to do so as well. On your way out, there are some of these and a number of other good ones too. But Cynthia, um, anything that comes to your mind for ways people can stay inspired in their spiritual walk? Um, I think you hit all the highlights, but it is very important. It's like any other relationship that you're willing to put time and effort in. You're going to spend time with that person. You're going to, you know, call them up, um, intentionally spend time with them. And it's like our relationship with God when we intentionally spend time with him and he becomes our whole being. Whatever we do, we can't help but share him because he is a part of our life. We can't help but say, I know this God that is so good and I want to tell you about him. And the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will come into place. So if that's my focus, then everything else, my relationships, my work, everything will be put into perspective. Mm. And yeah, God is gracious that Powerful. way. Powerful. So true. That reminds me of something we share with families often. How do you spell love? T-I-M-E. That's it. Putting time in with someone, whether that's a human relationship and it applies to God as well, like you pointed out. Uh, powerful. Thank you so much. Remember, drop a question into the box in the back, just behind the AV desk on the other side there uh, in the foyer, and we'll look forward to seeing your question. It's time, is that working? Sorry. Thanks, Ernie. It's time for corporate prayer. So I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer, find a comfortable position, and let's chat with our Heavenly Father. Almighty God, we are just so grateful to be here. We thank you for the rain that has refreshed our earth this morning. We thank you for you that refreshes us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for the creation that abounds and the beauty around us. Lord, we want to give you our worship today. We give you our praise. And we just ask, as David did, that you would accept our prayers, our worship, our offerings, our songs, that it might be like incense before you. Lord, there are things on our minds in our humanity that we often think about when we have a quiet moment. And as those things come to each one of us, whether it's for healing, for protection, whatever the desire of our hearts might be, we lay them now at your feet. We know that there is no problem so big that you can't solve it. And so hear our prayers, hear our individual prayers and our corporate prayers. We think of our world church, Lord, and we just ask that your blessing be continually upon our leaders, that they will continue to make wise and discerning decisions. And Father, we ask that for our church too. Thank you that our church is just blossoming and thriving. Thank you for the people of Hamilton Church. Place a blessing upon each family. Lord, there are others who may need you, um, and we think of Deirdre. We pray that you would comfort her, that you would heal her, and that she would receive and feel the kindness from the care that she is participating in. Father God, we know that Jesus calls us, calls us constantly, and we just thank you for that. We exalt you, Lord, that you are the King of the universe. May we hear the calling of Jesus this week in our lives, and we just ask now that you accept our worship, that we will walk with you, spend some time in our thoughts with you, that the Holy Spirit will be present. And we pray this because we are so very grateful for Jesus, your Son and our Saviour. Amen.
Shortly after Sharissa and I arrived here at Hamilton in 2019, we were blessed to have a group of um, five uh, Arise for Life students join us for six months. And uh, this young man was a little bit younger then, so was I. We all were. Uh, he joined us as a part of that team. And, you know, we were praying that uh, God would make a way for us to have a Bible worker continuing after that. And uh, Ryan said that he felt impressed to stay on longer and asked if he could stay on for another year. And so Ryan was here with us for a year and a half. And, you know, Ryan, I, I'm looking out and I'm seeing a lot of faces of people who weren't here yet when you left us. Um, but Ryan, Ryan worked very hard, very passionate, very dedicated. You know, we door knocked, and when I say we, it was probably like two thirds you, maybe even a little more with the, the time. Ryan was the type, of, um, the type of young gospel worker who was like, I don't feel like knocking on doors, but God has somebody out there who needs uh, to hear the gospel. And so I'm gonna do it anyway. And uh, you know, that's what God needs right? Like we may not always feel like doing the things we know we should, but uh, I praise the Lord for Ryan's dedication in that. During that time, and maybe toward the end of that time, he sensed God calling him to enter into the ministry. And so now he is just wrapping up his final year at Avondale University uh, before he launches out into mission service and uh, work as a pastor. And so Ryan, we're excited to see what God is going to do through you. Thank you for being willing to share the Word of God with us today. And um, yes, we look forward to the blessing that it will entail. We pray that you are not only spoken through today by God, but also spoken to. All good? Oh, you can hear me. Okay, no worries. So yeah, as, as Justin was saying, um, I was here before, I, I see a lot of new faces, and you know, I was really disappointed because he would call me up on the phone and he'd say, you should have been at church today, we had this many new people, and they, they was telling me all these amazing stories, and I just, I felt like, oh man, I left just that little bit too soon, because um, I was really excited, and so I might not know you uh, by name or by face, but I know your stories, or at least some of them. And that's been a huge blessing to me over the years when Justin has shared them with me. So I'm really excited to be here. This sermon today is called Real People, Real Problems. Because as I was going through and understanding kind of what this story is about, it became very apparent to me that what, what happens here is very human. And so we need to unpack it and understand it in its implications. And what does that mean for us? Before I jump into it, though, I'd like to tell you probably... Well, I'd like to ask you a question, like, why do we lie? It's, it's one of these things that just kind of pops out, right? It's that human nature. When, uh, when something bad is happening, we kind of want to twist fate and ensure that we get the outcome that we desire. So sometimes we just, we let a little lie slip out or we don't even notice. That's even worse. And we say something and afterwards we think, oh, that's not quite accurate. That's not quite true. And it's so part, it's so... It, it, interspersed in our human nature that, you know, even in drastic circumstances, it's one of the things that we turn to first. And there's a famous lie in history. Well, it's actually a, a famous ruse that happened in the Second World War. You see, the Allies wanted to invade um, Sicily. They wanted to deploy their troops down there. And they needed to get the German troops out of the way so that they could have a clear sweep through Sicily. And so they deployed what they called Operation Mincemeat. And so I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's a fascinating story. Early, early in the morning on April 30th, 1943, a submarine rises out of the, the Mediterranean Sea there, just, or the Atlantic Sea there, just off the coast of Spain. And it drops probably the most precious piece of intelligent counter espionage that the, the allies could come up with. It was a dead corporal by the name of Michaels, William, sorry, William Martin. He was acting as a major at the time and he was fake. He didn't exist. They had 
gotten this man, Glyndor, Glyndor Michaels, who was a homeless man, who had died by consuming something that wasn't quite good for him, and they had preserved the body and transformed him into this acting major, and they'd given him this suitcase, and inside the suitcase was all these intelligent documents that were all fraudulent. His whole life was a lie, everything about him. Um, and they took him and they laid him in the ocean as if something terrible had happened. You know, his ship had gone down and there's this, this U Butte acting major with incredible intelligence about the, tr about the Allies' plans to invade Greece and Sardinia. And so, of course, the, Span the Spanish, they picked him up. The Spanish were neutral during the war. And the German intelligence persuaded them to let them have a look at the, the suitcase before giving the man back to the Allies. And so the Germans, they went through and they looked through the suitcase and they found all these notes and these letters. And they were convinced that the Allies were going to invade Greece and Sardinia. And so they moved their troops. And so when the, the Allies eventually landed in Sicily and took that area, they did it with much less casualties. It's interesting, the first thought into winning the war was how can we trick and confuse? How can we twist fate so that we get our opportunities? I'm not here to debate with you whether or not the Allies, what they did was a good thing or a bad thing, but it becomes a much different thing when it's in our personal lives. And so today we're looking at the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And I've got a little roadmap here. So we're going to look at the context. What was actually happening in the Bible at the time? Then we're going to look at the lie that they told and the implications of that and what it actually means. Because when we read the story, it can seem like a very harsh punishment for something that didn't seem that big of a deal. And then we're going to look at the grace of God in the story. And so... The three things, the context, the lie, and the grace. So turn with me, if you will, or you can follow along on the screen if you can read that from where you are. Turn with me back to Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 33. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 33. And we need to read this to understand some of the context of what's happening here. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, isn't that beautiful? When the disciples are talking and recounting about the early days of the movement of God and Christianity in Jerusalem, they say that they're of one heart and one soul. They were in sync. Have you ever had a friend or maybe a spouse who could tell what you were thinking before you even said it? It can be a little bit annoying, can't it? But they generally know where you're going and what you're doing. And, and when you're having a conversation, maybe it's a story that you've told a thousand times. You can almost finish each other's sentences. How crazy is it then to be of one heart and one mind, to have one sole purpose, one sole focus with a group of believers? And at this point, there were no small group of believers, right? They were multiplying rapidly daily. You can imagine that there would have been 5,000 plus, right? There were a group of them, and they were all with the one sole focus. It, it can become invigorating when you play on a sports team and you're all working together to get the job done. It becomes less about who's the best shooter or who's the best at, at kicking the ball into the goal and more about let's do it together, let's win. And as you multiply that and more and more people are gathered together on your goal, it can be very exciting. So here, they were all of one heart and one mind. Neither did anyone say anything um, of the things he possessed was his own, but that, but that they had all things in common. Now, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. They all had one heart, one mind. They shared everything they had, and the apostles grave, gave great witness to the power of Jesus. That's our context for the first century church. It was something crazy 
something that I don't believe has happened in Christendom since. So you need to understand, Jesus had died, and with him, the disappointment of the disciples was huge. They were sitting there waiting, not understanding what was to happen next. And Jesus appeared to them and said, don't worry, I'm resurrected. And then he taught them and he explained to them and he said, wait here in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. And when the Holy Spirit comes, something fantastic is going to happen. He's going to teach you everything that you've learned for the last three and a half years in my ministry. He's going to bring that back to your mind and he's going to remind you of those lessons and then it's going to click into place. And you're finally going to understand what I was saying and why I was saying it and you're going to see it with fresh eyes. He actually said that well and truly before he died in John. It tells us that he promised them the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14. And so the the apostles, now that they have this Holy Spirit, now that they're out there preaching in tongues, and when the Holy Spirit came down in tongues of fire, they were compelled to preach and teach about the life of Jesus. There was nothing that could stop them because they had to share what they had heard. And so they were preaching with great power. And there were people who were coming from all different walks And they were meeting in Jerusalem, and they had all different languages, and they were hearing the gospel in their own language from people who were unlearned Galileans. And that was incredible to them. And so you can imagine these miracles that are happening are giving testimony or witness to what the apostles are saying, and the apostles themselves are giving witness to what Jesus has said and the lessons that he's imparted. And so the church, the first century church, is this alive thing. They're excited about what they have, friends, and they're excited to share. They're of one heart and one mind. And in fact, Satan was not excited that they were sharing what they had. When Peter and John went into the temple, the Pharisees, they got together and they said, these guys can't be preaching about the resurrection of Jesus. Let's lock them up. So they locked them up and they said, hey, don't go keep preaching about this. They said, we can't do that. We've got to obey God. And miracles attended at each part of the story. They had just healed a man who had been crippled for several years in front of many witnesses, a temple beggar who everyone knew who he was, right? So this is, this is the context of what, what we're dealing with in the story here. It's not just that they were of one heart and one mind. It's more than that. They were alive in Christ. They were excited. They were getting persecuted from the outside. And then Satan tried a very different tact. He tried to persecute them from the inside. And we're going to come back to that point. Remind me if I don't. So let's read the story now of Ananias and Sapphira. In in Acts chapter 5, it says this, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the proceeds his wife, also being aware of it, brought a certain, uh, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own in your own control? Why then have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And Ananias, hearing these things, these words, fell down and breathed his last. So a great fear came upon all who believed and heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now when it was about three hours later when his wife, when his wife came in, and Peter, ans- uh, sorry, Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her and said, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And and she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Holy Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And... The young men came in and found her dead, carried her out, and buried her next to her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Wow. It's not a very nice story, is it? 
We'd had up to chapter five, all these triumphs, one after the other, and then we get to Ananias and Sapphira, and these two people, disciples in the movement, there with the apostles, hearing, eating, learning from them, decide to sell their possessions, lie about it, and then they immediately drop dead. It's a little bit confrontational. It's in there for a reason, though, because it's a particular message for us. You see, we often kind of forget, as humans do, that God happens to see everything. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 says this, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. This is, of course, when Samuel the prophet went to Jesse's sons, and Jesse paraded them out one by one in front of Samuel because God said one of Jesse's sons will be the next king. So out comes this fine, strapping young man. You know, he's all big and burly, kingly in nature. And Samuel goes, wow, Lord, this is the guy. Look at him. This is what we expect a king to look like. And God says, no, that's not what a king is. Because, Samuel, for the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. It's interesting when we unpack this in relation to Ananias and Sapphira. Keep that in the back of your mind. God does not see as man sees. He looks at the heart. So, was God right? There are many, many problems at stake when we analyze this story. Did God do the right thing? Could there have been another way? And how does this reconcile with my understanding of a loving God? You know, I'll say this, and I'll say this multiple times, because this is an important part. I was actually talking with someone uh, last week about this. When we read stories like this, we, our mind jumps to people who we know have loved God in the past and are now walked away. And so, like I said, I'll bring this point up twice, because we tend to worry that, hey, maybe they're doing the same thing as Ananias and Sapphira here. And we get very concerned about their salvation. And we should be concerned about their salvation. That's not a bad thing. As we unpack in the story here, we'll understand that there is a loving God. He does care about us. There is grace. There is mercy. We're not instantly going to drop dead. But it's also important not to test God in that way. So the lie. Well, we don't really understand their context outside of the Bible as well as we should. You see, they sold everything that they had in common. Why did they do that? Well, back in their times, in the first century AD, it was commonplace for your family to be your support network. There was no such thing as Centrelink. There was no such thing as um, unemployment benefits, right? If you happen to need money, you work for the family or a relative or someone who's got a good family connection, you do business with them, or you sit out in the courtyard and hope, you sit out in the markets and hope someone wants to hire you, right? And your livelihood is all connected to your relationships. So it's much like this in the culture today in the Middle East. If you talk to a Muslim and you try to tell them about Jesus, they're, they're taking a huge risk if they accept Jesus because they'll get ostracized from their family. And so you've got this beautiful big movement that's telling people, hey, guess what? You know, Jesus was actually the Messiah. We killed him. Now we need to ask for forgiveness for that and come to him and learn what he said and taught because he's the promised one that we've been waiting for. And you have the religious leaders of the society saying, no, 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 Jesus wasn't the Messiah. And so you've got this tension in families. And it's what side are you on? And you can imagine as people decide to give their heart to Jesus and listen to what the apostles are saying and miracles are being wrought, their mothers and their fathers are kicking them out. Their uncles and their aunties are no longer employing them. And so people who would live in these close, tight family units are now schismed. What are they going to do? Perhaps they go down to the market and word travels very fast in a, in a cl- in a small city, right? They haven't spread out yet, so they're all still together in this city. And no one wants to hire them or give them work. 
because they're these weird Christians and there's this stigma. And so you can imagine, you've just lost your job, your family's just disowned you, you're wondering, what do I do next? So you're walking down the streets, down to the market, and there, your families and friends look at you with disgust. They turn their head. They walk the other way. They walk on the other side of the road. Some of your best mates who you used to play with, used to have fun, hang out, socialize, eat with, they want nothing to do with you anymore because of the stigma that you hold. What do you do? You sit there in the markets, go up to one of your employees and you say, hey, look, I just need, I need a place to stay. I need some work. I'm, I'm happy to forego the wages if you can just give me a meal and a bed tonight. And he says, I'm sorry, but I want nothing to do with you. That's what happened when these disciples accepted the Christian faith. So, you're sitting there wondering what to do, and along comes maybe one of the apostles, maybe Peter or John, and he looks at you and he says, cheer up, be of good courage. You've accepted Jesus, don't worry. There's a wealthy man who's just sold all his land so that we can have food, so that we can clothe you and house you. Come stay with us tonight. We'll pray about it. We'll read our Bible. We'll see what we're going to do next. Don't worry. You've got a home with us. And so this is the sort of environment that these people are in. In fact, in Acts 4.34, it says, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked... For all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of those, thing, of those things which were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite from the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. You've got a real life witness to this, recorded in the Bible, Joseph, or Joseph, was given the name Barnabas because of his good act. And so Ananias and Sapphira, right, they're possessors of land. They're not poor people. They're quite well off. They've got money. They've got means. So does Barnabas. Barnabas hears the gospel. Something springs to life in his heart, and he realizes, you know what, Lord? This doesn't matter. What matters is your church is in need, and I want to help. I've got Money, I've got plate, I've got land, I can sell that and I can give to this cause. And so that's exactly what he does. And you know, Barnabas wasn't expecting anything. He did it because he loved Jesus. And because of his love for Jesus, they gave him the name Barnabas, son of encouragement. This guy is a bulwark of the faith. He is a pillar of the early church. Without him and people like him, they probably wouldn't have had the ability to do what they did. Right? I mean, God was moving in them, but he was also moving on the hearts of these people to give their means. And so Barnabas, he was, when you think about him, he's incredible. He's the guy who went out with Paul on these missionary journeys. He's the guy who, when Paul or Saul became Paul, it was him and the apostles that met with him in Jerusalem. Right? When everyone was afraid, this guy Saul is just an imposter. He's just pretending to be one of us so that he can take us and put us in prison. Let's not have anything to do with him. Yeah, we've heard some rumors from the believers down at Damascus that he's a good guy now. He's one of us. But none of the other disciples wanted anything to do with Paul except Barnabas and the apostles. Wow, what a guy. What a reputation. What a stature. So when we understand Ananias and Sapphira and what they did, we need to understand who Barnabas is. He was a man of high stature. Not that he himself was puffed up or proud, because he gave his whole life for the gospel. The guy just, he, he went along with Paul and did these missionary journeys. He went out and preached. He went out to Antioch. This guy, he just lived for Jesus. 
And there's not much recorded about him other than what's in Acts, right? Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted that, they wanted that status. That's part of the reason they did what they did. And if you look back at the story, in order for them, for the, in order for them to do what they did, they had to be detached from reality a little bit. They had to be enjoying everything that was happening over here in the church and everything that was going on, and they could see that it was this movement that was powerful, but at the same time, they were over here with a little bit of pride, a little bit of greed, a little bit of selfishness in their heart. They were in the community, but they weren't all in. I wonder if that's like us today. I wonder if we can come to church once a week and open our Bibles and say that God is good and sing songs and then for the next six days we don't give it another thought. Or when we do, it's always in guilt because we haven't spent enough time with God. I wonder if for us, the things of this life like Ananias and Sapphira take up and consume so much of our time that we, by the end of the week, realize that we haven't really spent much time with God. See, I work as a forklift driver at the moment. And part of that work as a forklift driver means that I'm there focusing on the job at hand. When, when I was a Bible worker, I had a lot of time to think about what God's will was and what God wanted me to do and how he wanted me to act and what sort of spiritual conversations I was going to have. And so when you're working and you, you're focused on doing the job, little things creep in like, oh, man, I've got this bill to pay. And, oh, man, I wonder what I'm going to do after work. And, ah, oh, man, I'm going to be busy this weekend. My friends wanted to hang out. And sure enough, you get lost in these thoughts and they become all consuming, right? And you, you're focused in this environment and you lose sight of, well, what is beyond the here and now? What does God want me to do? What about if there's someone here that God wants me to reach? I mean, when you're really focused on your task, do you think about what God wants you to do? Or are you focused on your task? And then how easy is it from that to slip into thinking about all the other cares of life? Now you can imagine Ananias and Sapphira, right? They have this big property. They were listening to the apostles preaching. They made a decision. Just like Barnabas, they were going to do, uh, they were going to sell everything they had and they were going to give it to the apostles. They were going to distribute everything and they were going to be called Ananias and Sapphira, brother and sister of encouragement. They'd been convicted but perhaps when they got back from the meeting that evening or perhaps when they got back to their home, they talked it over and they decided, well, we've been a little bit rash. You know, we've, we've, still, we've still got a lot of things that are weighing us down. Perhaps they were going about their job and all of a sudden they remembered that they've got bills to pay and there's a tax man coming on Thursday and, oh, boy, what am I going to do? My uncle's sick. Does that resonate with you? Does sickness, health, happiness, spouse take our place, take the place of God in our lives? And so perhaps Ananias and Sapphira are sitting there and they realize this is a rash decision. Maybe we shouldn't give everything that we have sold to God. Maybe we should just give a portion of it. Was that wrong? Was it wrong for them to keep back a portion? I see a few people shaking their heads no. The Bible tells us very clearly. It says in Acts chapter 5, Peter said to them, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? In other words, hang on a sec, Ananias and Sapphira. Don't you realize that God had given you that possession to do with as you will and as he wills? Like, if you didn't want to give the whole thing, you didn't have to give the whole thing. 
there becomes an interesting point here. Well, it becomes more a matter of principle rather than the actual deed. And that's the story that we see in Ananias and Sapphira. If, right, if they had decided we're only going to give a portion of what we had sold, and that's the agreement that they'd made with God in their hearts, would they have been struck down dead? Definitely not. If they had reconsidered after they'd made that agreement and they came to Jesus, they came to the apostles and they said, you know, we, we sold everything that we owned. We've kept a portion from ourselves. This is how much we're willing to give to the movement, to the church. Would they have been struck and down dead? I don't think so. I think God values honesty. But they wanted the prestige that Barnabas had. They didn't want to give that up and they didn't want to give the money up either. See, they, they, they could be justified in wanting to hedge their bets, right? They could, they, they could rationally have this conversation with themselves and say, you know, this is a movement. We believe there's something different about it. But many movements have come and gone. What happens tomorrow if all of a sudden these Pharisees kick into gear and they send someone after us? What happens if they start locking people up? What happens if these people's money runs out? What are we going to do then? They could have kept a portion back for themselves. It would have been faithlessness. It would have been a bit of a shock to God. Well, if you can shock God. But it would have been saying that they didn't have trust. But it wouldn't have been lying. It wouldn't have been trying to deceive themselves. It wouldn't have been trying to deceive God. They weren't all in, but they tried to lie that they were. We often think of them, the money bag that they have, you know, and it was the money that was the problem. They were here over in the church and the money was, was what was pulling them out. But the reality is not everyone has the, the blessing of wealth. But the story of Ananias and Sapphira does relate to everyone. What if your money bag isn't wealth? What if it's those things that you watch? That person that you're with? The secrets, the secret guilt that you hold over the things that you enjoy? Could be drugs, could be alcohol. Could be a manner of other things. Could be pride. Could be the desire for exaltation. Whatever it is, this thing is a, is a seed in your heart. And we're going to look at that in a little bit. Are we all in? Or do we lie about it? Have you lied to your parents? I have. Um, I think if we're all honest, we can say that we probably lied to our parents. I used to love playing on video games. And when I got a phone, I used to love texting people late at night. And my mum, she would always come in. And they were, just like that was a quick little movement. And my phone or my games were underneath my pillow. Out of sight, out of mind, right? And mum would come in and she would say, are you asleep? No, mum, I'm not asleep. Were you on your phone? No, mum, I'm not on my phone. Lie. And somehow she always knew. As parents, you kind of know, right? Are there parents here who can tell when their child is lying to them? You can hear it in their voice. You can see it on their face. And sometimes you just know that they're doing the wrong thing because you know them. I was supposed to be asleep and instead I was staying up all night on, on my computer and so she would come in. Are you on your phone? No. Where is it? Oh, I don't know. Lie. Ryan, where is it? I think it's under my bed or something. Lie. She would walk over, and just reach under my pillow. <laughs> oh, that's where it is. 
It's funny, but it's terrible. And I, I'll take this sign that you're laughing is that this has happened to you before. When we do the wrong thing, our parents tend to know. We can always tell. How much more so with God? When Ananias and Sapphira came up and they were having a conversation with Peter, they weren't coming and having a conversation with Peter. They were having a conversation with God. They were continuing one that they'd already started a couple of days before when they, when they decided to sell their stuff. And the Holy Spirit had put on their hearts a desire to give everything they had. In that moment, they could have said, you know, God, um, I, I'm just a little bit worried about the future. They might have tried to reason that in their heart, and God probably gave them the answer through the Holy Spirit and said, Ananias and Sapphira, don't worry about the future. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Don't worry about that. And maybe they walked up home that day after selling it, and they saw the amount of money, and they said, this is too much. We can't give this. This is just too much. After this, we'll have nothing. And even then, maybe the, the Holy Spirit convicted them a little and said, no, but you promised. I wouldn't have asked you to give this all up if I didn't have greater plans. So they, they made a decision and they decided, and they went to Peter. And they said, here is the money that we sold the land for. This is all we have. This is what we've received. And the Holy Spirit says to Peter, they're lying. They lied to me. They didn't listen. You see, Ananias and Sapphira had the privileges that we could only dream of, of being there, hearing the apostles, seeing what they saw, witnessing the miracles. I mean, Peter walked down the street and people were lined up to get a glimpse of his shadow in the hope that they might be healed. That's unheard of. They had to be completely dishonest to themselves and to God in order to go through with what they did. 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 10 says this, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for, if we, brought, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out, and having food and clothing with all these, we shall be content. Lord, have mercy. What a far cry it is for us from this verse. Lord, I want that new car. Lord, I want that good job. Lord, I want to be able to afford this new phone. Lord, I want this. Even in the church it creeps in. If we only had this, our church would be nicer. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Does that cut to your heart as it cuts to mine? Are you content with just food and clothing? It goes on to say, but for those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, Ananias and Sapphira and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that money is evil. Money is quite useful. Without it, the gospel wouldn't have been able to be spread the way it was in the first century. And even today, we need money to build schools and plant churches and go out and perform medical missionary work in the remote jungles of the different places in the world. And without money, we wouldn't be able to do all these things. It's quite a useful tool. It can help us achieve a lot of great things in life. But the love of money, the love of money when it takes the place for the love of God, that is the root of all kinds of evil. When you think about it, it's just a tool at the end of the day. And how you use it determine, is determined by your relationship with God. If you have a talent for singing, how you use it is determined by your relationship to God. If you have a talent for preaching, how you use that is determined by your relationship to God. If you have a talent for AV, if you have a talent for talking, if you have a talent for intellectual things or building things, designing things, healing people, how you use that is all determined by your relationship to God. 
everything has a path which leads to self-aggrandizement, but there's also a path in which it can be a blessing to those around you and to Jesus. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. And this verse is, I said we'll come back to it. This verse explains what's happening in this situation in a much clearer way than we would be able to understand without it. But it's a little bit difficult to understand. So we'll go through it slowly. For it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift. These, this is talking about the people from the first century AD church. They're talking about people who have experienced the Holy Spirit in their lives. They're talking about people like Ananias and Sapphira who have been there when the apostles were speaking in tongues, probably even preached to other people about Jesus themselves. For it is impossible for those who have once enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Let's unpack that second part. It's talking about it is impossible for those who are connected to God through the Holy Spirit, right? They have the fullest sense and the understanding of who Jesus is. And friends, this is why I believe it was impossible for Satan to repent once he went out in open rebellion because he knew who God was. There was nothing more that God could do to show him who he is. Satan saw who God was and said, no, thank you. I don't want that. Ananias and Sapphira knew who God was. They saw him acting in their lives and they said, no, thank you. I'll keep my bag of money, thanks. No, thank you, God. I know you can see everything, but your disciples and your movement, they can't. They can't. So we'll just give them and tell them that we've sold everything. We'll come to church in the morning and uh, we'll go home and party later that day. No, thank you. Because if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame, there is one perfect sacrifice for humanity. That was Jesus. The Holy Spirit's not going to come down in human form live and walk as we did, and die so that we can have another chance. Jesus did that for us. God the Father's not going to come down, live and breathe as a human, and die so that we can have another chance. God did that in its entirety. He completed the mission in Christ. He showed, he laid all his cards on the table and said, this is what I have. This is how much I love you. Do you love me? This is who I really am. I'd rather die than miss out on spending eternity with you. There is no one more important to me in this universe than you. Jesus can't be crucified again. He did that action. He completed it. It was perfect. No matter how many times, it, hypothetically, if God was to reveal himself continually again and again to people who have rejected him once he has shown them the fullness of his character, they wouldn't change their mind because they're just not interested in God. They don't want what he's offering. And so Ananias and Sapphira being there, being in the situation that they were in, knowing what they knew, being part of takers of the Holy Spirit, having that voice talk to them very clearly, knowing exactly who Jesus was, knowing exactly who God is, said, no, thank you. We don't want a part of that. And that is why they were struck down dead. You see, if God had allowed them to continue they wouldn't have changed their hearts and their minds. They had made their choice. That was it. But what would have happened is Satan would have had an inroads into the church which he was trying to get into through exterior persecution. And today, church, if Satan fails to get to us through exterior persecution, he tries a different tactic. He goes through in internal corruption. So let me ask you today, do we live in a free church? where we can worship and practice our faith in its entirety? In Australia, for the moment, yes, we do. We have that. 
No one from the government is coming here today to stop me from preaching. And no one from the government is here today to stop you from praying. It's free in that sense. So what's Satan's tactic? If he can't get in through external persecution, he'll try and get in through internal corruption. So what's your money bags? Where is your heart? The Bible tells us in Exodus 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The Lord doesn't like people to deceive other people. How much more so when we talk with him? God God can work through a lot of terrible situations. He's shown that through the Bible, all the way from Adam, all the way through to the very end. He works with fallen people, people who say that they're a Christian and then they fall down. One thing he requires of us is to be truthful because he can fix someone who's truthful. He can help that person. If you come to him and you say, Lord, I'm struggling with this, He'll help you. And it's the same in business. You know, if we have a conversation with someone or we're talking with a friend in the family and we make a mistake, there's all the grace in the world if we acknowledge that mistake. Yes, we have to face the consequences. Yes, it's a little bit painful, but there's grace. Whereas if we say, no, no, I was right in doing what I did or saying what I said, we back ourselves into a corner and then we have confrontation. Each side takes a defensive stance and no one backs down. But when you come to Jesus and you lay it all open for him and you say, this is who I really am, God, please help. When you're honest and you don't try to hide it about who you are, then he can work in your life. Then he can change you. But until you're willing to be honest with God, how can he be honest with you? How can you see that? God is always honest, but how can you see that in your life? Because you're so busy deceiving yourself. God doesn't need Ananias and Sapphira's money. He doesn't need our money. It says in Psalms 50, 10 to 12, For every beast of the forest is mine, and every cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and its fullness. Friends, God doesn't need your money. The purpose of giving your money to the church, the purpose of of giving back to God, is so that you yourself can see where your heart is at. Every time you give your tithes and your offering, it's a voting. It's a voting booth for where your priorities lie. People say actions speak louder than words. That's what money is. It's your ticket to vote. Where your money goes is only a reflection of what's on the inside. So for Ananias and Sapphira, when we understand what happened in their story, when we understand the deeper context of where their heart was at, it makes a lot of perfect, it makes sense where their money went and what they tried to do to conceal it. Ephesians 6.14 says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's important that we're truthful to ourselves and to God about where our heart is at. Without a belt, your pants fall down and you get embarrassed. Truth is a belt. It stops you from being embarrassed. It's important that we take this. For God, he loves you. You're his chief concern. He lived as a slave having no home, wandering from town to town, living as a pauper, so that he might show that even the poorest of us have a place in his kingdom. If he had come as a rich person, if he had come as someone wealthy, if he had had the prestige that the Pharisees had, then we might be able to make an excuse for ourselves. But Jesus didn't come like that. He came poor. So why is it that when it comes to financial matters, we too can be so quick to forget what he has done for us? 
when it comes to sins in our life, we're too quick to forget what he's done for us. He hung up on that cross with all his disciples who had, had, when all his disciples had abandoned him. When he was personally at his lowest and discouraged, when he didn't think God loved him or couldn't see it through the sin. He hung there. And in that moment, the crowd was jeering at him. Get yourself down off the cross. If he had allowed that thought to dwell in his mind, perhaps he would have gone through with it. But for the love of you, he decided not to. For the love of you, he decided to stay up there. Because you are more precious to him than anything else. There's a story, and I'll finish on this. There's a story of a, a wealthy family that were very lovely, and there was this traveling preacher, Mr. Whitfield, and, uh, well, he would travel from house to house in the area, and he would preach the gospel with whoever he stayed at. And less, more than likely, the people that he was with were less amenable characters. They were a bit rough, a bit hard, and so when he came to this, this nice family's home, um, he was just blown away by the hospitality. They had everything that they needed in life. They were wonderful people, very comforting and charitable. And they gave him a little guest room to stay in. And he was wondering how he could bring the gospel to these people who had everything. And as he was praying on his last night, he heard the voice of God tell him, you need to preach the gospel to these people. And the story of the rich young ruler came to his mind. And praying about it, he decided that he was going to leave a little message for them. So he got up, he took off his ring, and he etched into the window pane, one thing thou lackest. Well, he woke up the next morning, said thank you to the family who'd been very charitable to him, and he bid them goodbye, and he went on his way. And the mother was perplexed because she had heard that this man at every house that he had stayed in had preached the gospel with fervor. And how come when, she came, when he came to stay with her, he had said nothing? So he, she went up to this man's room to see where the, church of, where, the, where the man of God had laid, and there she saw the window one thing thou lackest. At that point, a pinprick pierced her heart and she realized that she was missing Jesus. Perhaps today, friends, as you hear the story of Ananias and Sapphira, your heart has been pricked and you realize that you are missing Jesus. Maybe you know him or you knew him or you've had a relationship with him, but now your relationship with him isn't all that great. Perhaps you're like Ananias and Sapphira and you're in the church, but pride and greed have taken root in your heart and is threatening to produce ugly fruit. Jesus gave everything he had in this world for you. And all he asks is that we enter into relationship with him and value him above all else. So before we pray, before we have the final song, take a moment to reflect. Would the musicians like to come up as we sing the final song? Just sing the first verse and I will repeat the chorus twice.
is good. He's done so many wonderful things for us. If your heart's been pricked, if you feel convicted, and you say, Lord, I'm like Ananias and Sapphira. I've been dishonest to you. I've turned my back and I've allowed other worldly things to take my priorities in life. If you're being dishonest with yourself and you haven't been truthful to God, then I want to encourage you. Surrender all you have to Jesus. He won't reject it. He loves you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, wonderful God, we thank you so much for this day, for the privilege that we have to come and learn from your word. And Lord, we, we realize that the story of Ananias and Sapphira is harsh. And fear came upon all the disciples for the very reason that you are a holy God. And that when we come to you, we often forget just how holy you are that you've directed from ages, ancient ages past, up until the present day, the movements of the world, that you were in control, that you were the God who sees us and created us in our mother's womb. And Father, we just want to ask, help us, because we're sinners. We've done terrible things. We've lied to you and we've lied to ourselves and we've allowed seeds of evil to take root in our hearts. And they're tearing us away from you. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. And Father, I pray for the people here whose heads are bowed and they're struggling with financial matters and the gold and the silver of this world. And Father, your word says for us to lay up riches in heaven where the moths and the rust don't destroy. And Father, I want to pray that you'll strengthen them, that you'll give them the courage to surrender that to you. I want to pray for people who are struggling with addictions of all sorts, whether that be drugs, alcohol, or even, uh, you know, the social media and the TV that we see today and the video games, Lord, that we have. I want to ask for those people that you'll give them the strength to keep coming back to you regardless of how much guilt and shame they feel. But, Father, that you'll break them free from those addictions. And, Lord, I want to pray for all of the heads bowed who have a sense of pride, a worldly pride on, on their self-aggrandizement. And Father, I just ask that you will humble us, that you will show us how much you care for us and how much you sacrifice, that we might do the same, that our stature means nothing. We can decrease and you can increase. And Father, I pray for every other church member here bowed, whose heads bowed, that you'll bless us all, Father, and you'll send us through this week in your grace and peace that we might come to know you more as we spend time in relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.